Welcome to the Crescent City, where Vital Options is in New Orleans with ASH, the American Society of Hematology. This is Selma Schimmel with Vital Options and the group room at the ASH meeting, the American Society of Hematology, meeting that's taking place now in New Orleans. And when we come to these meetings, we always like to feature someone who's making a difference for the patient community under our Advocate in Action series. And joining me today is Susan Stewart, who is the founder and executive director of the BMT Info Network. Hello, Susan. Good afternoon. So you founded in 1990, and so I have known of you all of these years. I remember receiving your original newsletter. And I've said for many, many years, one day, I think you did the radio show mm -hmm. in the past with us, and then we transitioned to video, and I always said, one day we're going to do something with you. And here at the ASH meeting seemed like the ideal time to shine a spotlight on your years of work. And I want you to tell us a little bit about what is the BMT Info Network, why did you establish it, and what are you doing today, and especially now, at a time when there's so much transition that you've lived through in the way we treat our hematologic cancers. So thank you for having me. We are delighted to be able to talk about BMT InfoNet and the range of services it offers to people who are facing either a bone marrow, stem cell, or cord blood transplant. Uh, we found there the organization in 1990 after I had a bone marrow transplant for acute myelogenous leukemia. And at the time I was going through treatment, there was absolutely no information in print form, there was no internet, there was nothing out there to educate people about what to expect uh, when they go through a bone marrow stem cell transplant. Um, and for many people like myself, no one even knew of another person who had had a transplant with whom they could talk and get some information about what to expect from the patient side. So we first started out as a newsletter that would explain in some detail what's involved in going through a transplant, you know, what the steps of the procedures are, what the side effects are, what the long-term complications are, how you make choices about which transplant center to go to, et cetera. And eventually we evolved into a much larger organization with a much broader agenda, which we have today. So we have a number of patient initiatives to educate patients in a variety of manners about what to expect during transplant. We have uh, several books that are written in lay language that are really fairly technical, but written in a way that the average person without a medical background can understand. And they're referred to by many of our patients as their Bible as they go through the transplant when they're getting ready to talk with their doctor um, and formulate questions. They can use the books to help uh, articulate the issues that are of concern to them. When they get information from physicians, which is sometimes not in lay language, they can refer back to the books in to order to understand exactly what's being said. And they can also use them to educate not just themselves, but family members and friends who are often really pretty clueless about what's involved when a person goes through a transplant. Um, a lot of times friends and neighbors and family think you go into the hospital and when you come out of the hospital it's kind of like surgery. A couple weeks later you're recovered and, and there's no big issues. But for a transplant patient, there can be issues that go on many months and many years after transplant. And so these books help educate them. What are some of the issue, the acute and the longer term issues that uh, bone marrow transplant survivors deal with? Well, there's a range of issues and it really varies according to the type of transplant you had. Uh, when I was having a transplant, there was a one pretty standard transplant. You would get high dose chemotherapy with total body irradiation or with a combination of chemotherapy drugs followed by a transplant. But nowadays there are actually several forms of transplant. You can have a transplant using your own bone marrow or stem cells. You can have a transplant using uh, unrelated donor cells and you can have one using related donor cells. And you can have something called a non-myeloablative or reduced intensity transplant which actually involves much lower dosages of chemotherapy than in a standard transplant. So the side effects from that are really quite different. But typically, when a patient's going through transplant, the high-dose chemotherapy and or total body irradiation uh, creates a number of side effects. And the best way I can describe this to patients is to think about the absolute worst case of the flu you have ever had 
and instead of feeling that way for several days, it's going to be several weeks. Because what the therapy actually does is seek to destroy as many cancer cells as possible. And in doing so, they also destroy many of the normal cells in your body, including your immune system cells. So basically, what it does is bring you to the brink of death, and then the transplant, the new marrow or stem cells, recover you from that point, and you gradually get better. But you will have infections, possibility of infections, there's possibility of organ damage, there's uh, cognitive changes that go on in people that can be temporary or long-term, mouth sores, throat sores, um, uh, de not depression, but de uh, delusions, particularly from some of the drugs used to treat uh, the side effects, other side effects. So th they can be very short-term or very long-term. And the graft versus um, host issues? Yes, absolutely. If you're going through a transplant where you're using someone else's cells, mm -hmm. be it a related or an unrelated donor, uh, there is the issue of graft versus host disease, which is a condition where the donor's cells, which have been trained to know what belongs in the donor's body, get put into the patient's body. Mm -hmm. And when they get put into the patient's body, they don't recognize some of the normal cells in the patient's body as cells that should be there. So they unleash an immune system attack on the patient's body, which is what is called graft-versus-host disease. And it can be mild, it can be moderate, or it can be quite severe, and it can last a couple months, it can last a couple years, and in rare cases, you know, more than five or six years. With the emergence of so many new targeted therapies, immunotherapy, which mm -hmm. is becoming uh, such a dynamic hope for solid tumors as well. Are you seeing changes in the transplant setting based on some of these newer innovative therapies that are being integrated into what has been standard therapy? Not as much as you would think. Um, we are seeing some new drugs, some novel agents that are um, reducing the need for transplant or the need for an early transplant. But in terms of the actual procedure itself, um, some of them do not have the same side effects as the traditional chemo drugs, but the long-term side effects tend to be very similar. Things like cognitive changes, which uh, can affect memory or concentration, uh, things like chronic fatigue, uh, in some issues, chronic pain. Um, those kinds of issues really do continue you know, quite a long term. So talk about the resources in addition to the newsletter. Are organizations that are out there collaborating with you, are you getting the kind of collaborative support that you need? If not, it's your opportunity for us to try to help encourage, because you do something that is unique and you do not duplicate another service. You actually are very supportive to the uh, goals of many organizations that are out there and fill a very specific niche. Right, and we do collaborate to the extent that we're able on as many issues as possible. One good example is our survivorship symposiums. Um, we have led the way in providing experts after transplant in a uh, conference setting, a two-day conference setting, that address a lot of the issues that patients don't find well addressed by their primary oncologist or even their transplant centers. Um, <clears throat> they range anywhere from you know, man uh, detecting and managing GVHD <clears throat> to chronic pain, to fatigue, uh, to nutritional issues, uh, to emotional and psychological challenges, not just for the patient but for the entire family. And we coordinate these symposiums uh, once every 18 months with all of the transplant centers in a particular region, uh, as well as patient advocacy groups. So for example, uh, our next one will be in September of 2014 in the New York, uh, New Jersey area, and LLS, LRF, you know, all of the patient organizations that have some interest in blood disorders will be participating with us and planning the agenda, bringing experts to the patients that attend, and we expect well over 500 people to be there. Patients that are going to experience a bone marrow transplant will then learn about you through the Cancer Center or one of the affiliated organizations. The Cancer Information Service, for example, will refer to us frequently. American Cancer Society refers to us frequently. 
Um, many of the transplant programs use our publications and our other resources as part of their patient education program. So people do find out about us in a variety of different ways. In addition to the publications, we have other services. We provide a support network called our Caring Connections Program, which is a one-on-one -on -one personal link with another person who's had a similar experience. And we now have over a thousand people who have volunteered to be part of this network to provide emotional support. And we can pretty well link people with any other person who's had a disease that's similar. Uh, we can link them by people who've had children mm -hmm. at home at the time of their transplant and want to talk about those kinds of issues. May link them with people who have a very rare disorder um, and are debating whether or not to go to transplant. Uh, and it's a very successful way uh, that's not necessarily internet-based for people to get information from other patients about what to expect. What are the publications you're holding on your lap? Well, this is, we have two of them. And actually, we started out as a newsletter, and the newsletter became the basis for these publications. And uh, these are what are used by the transplant programs. Uh, one is called Bone Marrow and Blood Stem Cell Transplants, a Handbook for Patients. And this is for people who are undergoing a transplant using donor cells, either stem cells or cord blood from a related or an unrelated donor. And the second is a book called Autologous Stem Cell Transplants, which is the term to describe a transplant where you use your own cells. So for example, people with multiple myeloma frequently undergo an autologous transplant. Mm -hmm. um, people with some solid tumors are sometimes candidates for uh, uh, autologous transplants. But the books walk you through step by step what to expect before, during, and after transplant, and um, are really very handy and very uh, helpful for people as they're planning the transplant journey and as they go through it. If our viewers would like to uh, obtain a book, how do they go about doing so? They can go to our website where there is also a lot of information, www.bmtinfonet.org, and they can order a book online, and they can also read uh, portions of the book online if they prefer to do it that way. And fees for the book? There is a fee. It's an $8.95 fee. We do waive that for people who aren't able to afford it. So it's, it's accessible to anyone regardless of income level. Thank you, Susan. Uh, when you think back of the history of your work going to 1990, we're entering 2014, you should be very proud. Well, thank you so much.